starting now uh, we will be welcoming Dr. Lincoln in a couple of minutes and uh, people are still streaming in but we are just going to start because I am going to begin by reading um, a short biography uh, regarding Dr. Lincoln and then when he comes on we will just continue on and have his presentation on the topic of why is the world center of the Baha'i faith in Israel. I find that um, this question has been posed to me by many of my friends and it is one of those things that I think would be nice to be able to share with our friends. Um, so uh, I am just going to start now. Welcome everyone. It is very nice to see everyone's faces. Uh, tonight, tonight, August 16, 2020. Dr. Albert Lincoln, as Secretary General of the Baha'i International Community, served from 1994 to 2013. And he represented the elected international governing body of the Baha'i faith in international forums and interactions with heads of state and government, diplomats, high officials, and leaders of thought from many parts of the world. Based at the Baha'i World Center in Haifa, Israel, he was also responsible for the management of its host country relations, including dealings with national and municipal authorities, Jewish and Arab community leaders, and organizations of civil society. His efforts to foster harmony and mutual understanding among the various religious communities were recognized by an honorary doctorate conferred by the University of Haifa in 2010 and an award of merit from the city of Haifa in 2013. Before moving to the Holy Land, Dr. Lincoln practiced law for 23 years in France and Africa serving a clientele comprised of international institutions, embassies, and multinational corporations, as well as local businesses and individuals of many nationalities. His litigation experience included the defense of political and religious dissidents, as well as former officials put on public trial following a change of regime. He was called upon to respond on behalf of the Baha'i international community to serious threats to religious freedom in various parts of Central and West Africa. Dr. Lincoln then retired in December of 2013 and is presently an active member of the Baha'i community of Portsmouth, New Hampshire, while traveling nationally and internationally to address a variety of audiences, give courses and consult with Baha'i institutions. He is a frequent speaker and presenter on subjects including interfaith understanding, heritage preservation, and various aspects of the history and teachings of the Baha'i faith. He is married to Joan Lincoln, and they have three grown children and seven grandchildren who live in Switzerland, the United Arab Emirates, and the United States. Uh, so this is our 
dear guest, Dr. Lincoln. If uh, we are ready, I would like to welcome him on to our screen now. As you can see, everybody has been muted. At the end of the presentation, when there will be a question and answer period, if you could please type in your questions. If there is capacity, I will ask each of you to read your own questions. If not, I will just read them out loud, but I'm sure at the very end, there will be a time for people to be able to say hello and speak to Dr. Lincoln directly. Until then, we will all stay on mute. And with that, I welcome Dr. Lincoln. It's very, very, very nice to see you and we're very happy and honored to be able to welcome you. Uh, will we, so we are going to share the screen. Good evening, everybody, uh, or good afternoon or good morning, whatever time it is in the physical space that you're occupying. Uh, it's a pleasure to, to see you here and um, looking forward to the interaction we'll have in the question and answer period. Okay, good. Well, friends, as most of you know, the World Center of the Baha'i Faith is located in Haifa and Akka in what is now Northern Israel. <clears throat> the view you're, you're seeing in the picture there is from the ridge of Mount Carmel, looking out over the Shrine of the Bab with the golden dome there in the center. Uh, at the, um, across the, the Bay of Haifa to the city of, of Akko, or Akko, and uh, some of the hills you can see in the far distance are actually the, the hills of southern Lebanon. Um, beautiful as the, as the scenery is, because of the controversial nature of almost everything in the Middle East, uh, many people ask why the Baha'i Center is located there. Uh, there are several underlying questions to that, which are often unspoken. Uh, one of them is, is there some special relationship with, with Judaism? Is there any truth to the allegations made by the Iranian regime that Baha'is are tools of Zionism and spies for Mossad? And are Baha'is somehow complicit in the mistreatment of Arabs by the Israeli authorities? These are some of the things that are lurking in people's, in people's minds. And this evening, in exploring the historical, geographical, and religious dimensions of the matter, uh, I hope to give you the information to answer these and, and, and other questions. Um, this is the basic outline of what uh, I want to present. Uh, it will include a, a brief synopsis of the Baha'i Faith, very condensed. Uh, under the historical dimension, there'll be a little overlap with some of what I presented last month in July, um, but much again, also much more condensed. So if you see a few slides that you've seen, be seen before, um, don't, don't worry, they'll go by quickly. And then we get into the geographical and religious dimensions and a little bit about how the relationship actually works in practice, um, and how uh, the, the, the Baha'i Center and the, uh, uh, operates within the, the, Israel, the Israeli context. Um, so moving straight on to the synopsis of the Baha'i Faith, uh, as the basic definition of the Baha'i Faith is a monotheistic faith in the Abrahamic framework. And that is true both in terms of, of genealogy and, and belief. In terms of belief, it's one creator, source of all the religions, including Judaism, Judaism Christianity, and Islam. Um, and that there's a universal core in these religions. And that it's the pedagogy and the adaptation of social teaching to time and place that accounts for many of the differences. In terms of genealogy, as you can see from this chart, um, Baha'u'llah down here at the bottom, his um, his father is a descendant of Zoroaster, and through Zoroaster, uh, uh, one of the to J Jacob and Judah and, and David. Um, his mother um, is through one of the sons of Keturah, and um, descended to to Baha'u'llah. Um, you may or may not be able to see, but the Bab is is a direct descendant of 
of Muhammad and is therefore also a descendant of Abraham. Um, the other thing to note here is that this is a religion born in historical time. We're used to thinking in, in whenever we talk about religion, about things that are basically in archaeological time. We're dealing with relics and trying to interpret and understand them. But Baha'u'llah was born just a little over 200 years ago. He was a contemporary of Abraham Lincoln, Queen Victoria, Karl Marx, Sigmund Freud, just to name a few that are familiar. Um, he was the first um, prophet or messenger to be photographed, uh, first, I think, to be personally literate, the first to appear after the intervention of the printing press. So there's an enormous amount of uh, historical evidence about these things that I'm going to be covering uh, today. <clears throat> Just again, to talk about synopsis, uh, the Baha'i Faith is, is certainly a religion of the word, and all religions are essentially about the word of God, um, but the, the sheer volume of the corpus here is enormous. Altogether, in total, it's some 84,000 works and 21 million words. Um, the authentic scripture is in Persian and Arabic. Uh, the Bab, the forerunner, wrote 2,000 works of more than 5 million words. Baha'u'llah himself authored 18,000, many of them shorter. Bob obviously, um, and more than, totally more than six million words. Um, just by way of, of comparison, the, um, <coughs> the, the, ent the entire Quran is about 78,000 words. Uh, the King James Version of the Bible is about 783,000, of which the Old Testament or Torah is over 600,000. Um, if you take the words attributed to Jesus in the New Testament, um, they're um, about, uh, it comes down to about a thousand or two thousand, depending on how you count the parallel versions in the different gospels. But when you think actually of a thousand words, it's a couple of typescript uh, type um, pages. Um, in addition to the what we see as the revelation itself, there were specific powers given to uh, appointed uh, successors to interpret and explain over some 65 years. And that's um, another 64,000 uh, unique works. Uh, Abdul Baha, the son of Baha'u'llah, wrote in Persian, Arabic, and Turkish, in more than 5 million words and 30,000 works. And his grandson, Shoghi Effendi, uh, authored another 34,000 works in Persian, English, French, and Arabic. Um, again, another five, five million words. So the corpus, as I said, is really uh, enormous. Um, just to run quickly through some of the, some of the essential teachings, um, oneness of God, as I mentioned, oneness of religion and of mankind, combating prejudice, and explicit support for the notion of remedial discrimination. Uh, in terms of family life, uh, marriage requires con consent of parents. Uh, the equality of men and women necessarily implies consultation, the decisions being made in the family by consultation between husband and wife. Uh, in tremendous importance on the education of children uh, and intermarriage with people of different races and different religions is not only permitted, but actually encouraged. Um, Baha'is believe that work is a form of worship when it's done with the spirit of service and, and al in an altruistic spirit. Um, there are clearly are connections between aesthetics and the human spirit. The human spirit responds to beauty and, this, and there's a spiritual element in that in that response. Um, Baha'i uh, <clears throat> teachings include laws for prayer and fasting, which are a kind of essentially a spiritual practice and a spiritual exercise. Um, we do believe in an afterlife. Uh, obviously, any one of these subjects could be the, the, the subject of a whole, of a whole uh, 
presentation on its own. But uh, I promised you a very concise uh, uh, synopsis. So here's quickly the, the sequence of, uh, or the flow of authority and succession in the faith is first Baha'u'llah, who um, declared his mission in 1863 and passed away in 1892. His son was appointed in Baha'u'llah's will to be the, the center of the, of, of the faith after him. Uh, and he lived until 1921 uh, and actually visited North America. We'll talk about that a little bit later. His grandson lived until 1957. And um, during the, in the writings of Mahala, he already provided for institutions which would um, administer the community. And that th those institutions were already being built at the local and national level during the time of Abdul Baha and Shoghi Effendi. And the international body was elected in 1963 and is now the at the, 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 the summit of the, of the hierarchy. Um, so there, in the Baha'i faith, there are, there's, no, there's no clergy, um, and it is these, these institutions which are elected, the, the, their, the members are more ordinary members of the community who don't have a special, special status. They're elected by democratic means, and um, form a uh, structure which is um, in different levels and um, decentral de decentralization, the gov international governing body, the Universal House of Justice uh, is elected every five years uh, by the members of uh, roughly 175 national spiritual assemblies, which in turn are elected every, every year. And they're about 10,000, roughly 10,000 local spiritual assemblies that are elected by their own local communities. Um, so I'm going to switch now to move on to the history and um, mentioning, of course, that, the, um, that, that there is uh, some overlap with what we discussed last month. But the um, as I mentioned, we're talking about the 19th century. It was a period of spiritual fermentation and messianic expectation in different religions. Um, there was Hasidism and Judaism, Adventism and Mormonism and Christianity, Ahmadiyya and Sunni Islam, and a very strong millennial fervor, especially in Shia Islam, because it was 1,000 years since the disappearance of the 12th Imam who was expected to reemerge uh, in, eight, in 1260 by the Islamic calendar, which is 1844 uh, by the uh, common, in the common era. Uh, the Bab, the forerunner, declared himself in 1844. His follow, following grew rapidly and, and the rapidity of the growth provoked a brutal repression. These are a few images of, of that. Um, and then the Bab himself was executed by a firing squad in 1850 under circumstances that only uh, spread further the, or, or ignited further the, the, the rapid spread of the, of the faith. Um, uh, Baha'u'llah was, was foretold and referred to in the writings of the Bab. Um, he was also imprisoned and then exiled from Tehran to Baghdad, then to Istanbul, Constantinople, uh, and Edirne, and finally to the, the Holy Land, as you, you'll see. He arrived in the Holy Land in 1868 um, and was uh, sent, as to a, sent by the Ottoman authorities to the city of Akka, or Akko, which was then functioning essentially, it was a, a very low period in its history, and it was functioning essentially as a, um, a prison colony, uh, a remote place to send un unwanted and troublesome people. <laughs> and uh, so that, that was the choice. It was also rather a bad climate, and I think there was some hope that uh, the troublesome people who were sent there wouldn't, wouldn't last very long. Uh, as it happened, Baha'u'llah did uh, last quite a while, and um, 
It was it lived the last 24 years of his of his life there. So he here he arrived in Akka um, in 1868, 152 years ago. He was uh, incar incarcerated in this citadel for a number of years. Um, then the conditions relaxed gradually, and he passed away and uh, was was buried in uh, nearby in 1892. Um, much of, much of the written work that I referred to earlier was penned during this this 24 years um, in. In, in the Holy Land, he visited uh, Haifa on another a number of occasions. Um, actually, pitched his tent, the one um, that you see there, one very similar to it, next to this um, house, which is located was built by some German Templars who'd come expecting the return of of Christ, and wrote over their doorway, "The Herr ist nahe," uh, meaning the Lord, the Lord is near. Um, and during one of the visits um, to, to Haifa, Baha'u'llah chose the place for that shrine with the golden dome that you saw. And um, in, in his writings, he um, uh, selected and, and chose Mount Carmel as the seat of administration um, for the, the future, the community, which was just coming into existence. So this is a period of exile. He, Bahala was sent, was exiled by Sultan Abdul Aziz, who, as I've uh, implied, was not trying to do him any favors. Um, he wanted to get, get rid of him, um, and I guess had learned something from the results of the execution of the Bab. So rather than, than, than have him executed, he thought it'd be better to sort of just quietly dispose of him in a, dist in a remote and unhealthy uh, location, um, but the but the choice of the Holy Land, which is what we're going to be what we're talking about tonight, um, was something that Baha'u'llah accepted as a fulfillment of destiny, the, the, despite the um, the unkind in the intentions of the, the, the of the decision makers. Um, the this choice also. Uh, had a good deal to do with the early stages in the spread of the faith uh, because of the, uh, it was on the, Medi um, Akko was on the Mediterranean, it was located in an area where connected, and we'll talk later about the location and the connections, um, but, and dur during, partly due to the, to his own exile and partly due to the persecution, persecution of his followers in Iran, the, the faith spread throughout um, the Ottoman Empire, into Turkey, but also into Egypt, Sudan, India, um, uh, uh, and and um, and into southern uh, southern Russia, Tur Russian Turkmenistan. Um, the spread to the to the west really was something that took place during the period of Abu Baha. Um, this gentleman here in the begin in the in the middle of this picture. Uh, is a Lebanese, uh, of Mar a member of the Maronite sect who beca um, became a Baha'i in Egypt and then traveled to the United States. Here he's sitting with some of the first Western pilgrims to visit uh, Abdul Baha in, in Akka. Um, the gentleman in the upper left corner is, um, was probably the first African-American person to become uh, first of African-American believer. He was on this trip because he was the butler of the lady who was financing it, uh, but he was received with great respect and affection by uh, Abu Baha when he arrived in Akka with this, with this group. Um, some years after, I mean, th this was eight, 1898, that first pilgrimage. In 1911, 1912, 1913, Abu Baha himself was uh, able to travel and visited Europe and North America. Here he is under the um, Eiffel Tower in Paris on the left and speaking before in a church in Chicago um, on the right. Uh, through his efforts and um, and others, the, the, the Baha'i Faith then spread um, 
to vir vir virtually all the, all continents and sort of the some quite distant places all before 1921, um, and then the um, sorry, and, and then from in a later stage up till 1963, virtually everywhere but the but the Soviet bloc. Um, in the starting in the in the 1960s, 70s, and and 80s, the not the number of Baha'is began to increase quite dramatically, so that in the space of 20 years, it went from about half a million, a little less than half a million, to over five million, um, and this really uh, put put some some meat on the bones. Um, the another thing that was happening at the same time was a shift in geographical distribution. Um, again, this is a subject of longer discussion, but just to note that uh, by the, the mid 1980s, um, 100,000 out of 113,000 localities where there were Baha'is was in, in essentially in the third world, where the growth was much slower in in the west and in um, in the middle east the islamic heartland which was the the, the uh, original source of course of the of the baha'i faith um, this result is illustrated here uh sort of visually on the on the right in terms of the physiognomies but in the left uh these pie graphs comparing the baha'i population with the world population again we won't um spend time on this, but, whoops, sorry. Uh, it's worth noting that three quarters of the Baha'i population is in Africa and Asia, which corresponds to the reality of the world population as well. There are differences in, in some of the other proportions. Baha'is are underrepresented in, in Europe, somewhat overrepresented in North America and Latin America and Africa, uh, but that sort of basic three quarters in Africa and Asia is significant in that uh, it allows Baha'is to really see themselves as representing the, the diversity of the world population. Um, so that's that's the quick history uh, and I'm going to move on now to the some of the geographical and, um, and religious dimensions and I thought I'd just put up this map um, in case you can't visualize the unique location of um, the Holy Land. Of course, you know where it is. Um, but if you, when you look at it, you can see that it's actually um, a land bridge, not a very wide bridge at that, between, it's linking three continents, Europe, Asia, and Africa. Um, the, uh, we see it very visible visibly in Israel because of the migration of the, bir the birds right north and south and it's a tremendous center of, of migration of birds. But historically, it's been also um, co constantly trodden, trodden underfoot by human migration, uh, including many conflicts long before the, the current Middle East, uh, Middle East uh, disputes. Um, it's, uh, Israel also is, has, uh, access to both the Mediterranean and, and the Red Sea. Um, and if you add the Dead Sea in, in the middle, there's, there's, there's three, three seas, the, the Med, the Dead, and the Red. Um, it's also very much in the middle between East and West and, can, and is a meeting place for Oriental and um, and Western cultures as, as a result. Um, it's also centrally located between the North and the South. It's neither really part of Europe and North America, so the so-called developed West, nor is it exactly part of the underdeveloped South, but it is. it has elements of both of those. And it is, it's therefore geographically neutral in a, in a, in a unique, in a unique way. Um, as, as I mentioned, um, you know, the, these characteristics have in the, in the past, let's say part of the immature period of the human race been the source of a lot of conflict. Um, and you, you can trace that back over thousands of, of years. 
Um, and of course, we all know that for the last century, something about the kind of turmoil that has uh, racked the Middle East uh, since the, the First World War. Um, I don't need, I think, to remind you that uh, it is the historic homeland of Judaism. It's the cradle of Christianity, where, where Jesus and most of the apostles spent their lives. Um, it is also very important to Islam. It's linked with the night journey of um, the prophet Muhammad, and um, Jerusalem is considered the second most holy, holy site in, in Islam. Um, I want to just uh, quickly remind you a few things why the connections, um, uh, these are connections in, uh, with, the, with um, or elements in different um, traditions and scriptures that Baha'is at least believe relate to the coming of Baha'u'llah. These are a few brief citations from um, the Hebrew scriptures. Uh, referring to uh, someone coming from from the east, from Assyria, which refers to the period, to the area including Persia, Iran, where Baha'u'llah was coming from. It also refers many times to the glory of the Lord, which is in fact the title that Baha'u'llah bore. Baha'u'llah means the glory of God. Um, and so the, the, these are, are significant hints of thing, things to come. Um, the within, in Christianity, I mean, you are familiar with the history of Adventism, or sometimes called Millerism. William Miller is one of the people who worked out the prophecies, uh, the biblical prophecies about the, the return of Jesus, and and calculated that it should have ha was should happen in 18, 1844, and um, he's one of the people who influenced the Templars who came and settled in in Haifa at the foot of Mount Carmel, waiting for Jesus, the, the arrival of Jesus. Um, then there are also in Islam some remarkable traditions uh, of, of uh, statements of, of Muhammad about the city of, of Akka, um, a city in Syria. Syria was at that time a description of the region uh, to which God has shown his special special mercy. Uh, it talks about a uh, city on the shores of the sea whose whiteness is pleasing under God, exalted be he, it's called Akka. The people of Akka, the poor of Akka are the kings of paradise and princes thereof. A month in Akka is better than a thousand years elsewhere, uh, and, and, and so on. So there are these, these elements from the preceding religions that all call, call attention to this location and which uh, Baha'is understand as references to Baha'u'llah and his, and his arrival. Um, there's a <clears throat> very interesting story concerning Elijah. As many of you know, um, one of the primary uh, significant, religious significance of, of Mount Carmel is the cave of Elijah, who's one of the, the Hebrew prophets. And uh, Elijah is, uh, in Jewish traditions, expected to return and announce the coming of the Messiah. Uh, there is a, a passage in the New Testament where Jesus is asked if he is Elijah. And he says, no, John the Baptist is Elijah. And this introduces this concept of the re return of past figures in, in a, obviously a new, identity, new human identity, but with the same function. And Baha'is belief that, that uh, Elijah has come again in the person of the Bab, who was as I mentioned earlier, is buried there on the slopes of Mount Carmel. So that, that's some of the um, religious, dimension, religious and geographical dimensions of the, of the question. And I'm going to turn now to talk a little bit about how the, the relationship of the Baha'i World Center in that social context, how it actually, actually functions in, in practice. 
And I want to point out, first of all, that since the arrival of Baha'u'llah, there actually have been three successive um, uh, governmental regimes um, essentially related to three different religious regimes. So first, there were 40 years under Islamic rule in the Ottoman Empire, followed by 30 years of the British Mandate, which was essentially Christian in its orientation. And uh, then the current period, 72 years and counting, uh, as part of the State of Israel. So here you have a, the world center <coughs> of an independent world religion uh, managing to exist under successive regimes of very different um, orientation. Um, the, the, the nature of this relationship is, is one which is very much above board and, and mutually respectful. Uh, an agreement was signed in 1987 between the Baha'i World Center and the uh, government of Israel, uh, which recognizes it as, and so, um, regulates the, the status of the, of the Baha'i World Center um, in, in the Holy Land. Uh, interestingly enough, this was actually the first agreement, formal agreement between the government of Israel and another religion. The agreement with the Vatican came a number of years uh, later. Um, the, uh, <clears throat> there are a number of rather unique characteristics of the Baha'i World Center. Um, and one of them is that there is no local Baha'i community in, in Israel. There's a rotating staff of six to 700 volunteers, usually from about 75 different countries. Um, the legal and financial independence of the Baha'i World Center is established by this agreement that you're looking at. And um, also some of the main activities of the Baha'i World Center, which include administration for the whole worldwide Baha'i community, uh, the pilgrimage, which we'll talk about a little bit later, and uh, also having uh, maintaining sites that are open to the, to the public. This, this is a view of the administrative complex on the slope of Mount Carmel. Um, and, Wait a minute. There it is. Uh, and, and this is the central edifice, which is the seat of the elected governing body. Um, the actual elections also are held every five years in Haifa. This is a photo of the last, uh, the most recent such gathering. I shouldn't say last, but uh, let's hope that the pandemic allows <laughs> allows the future of such gatherings, but this was in 2018, and it is a, a, um, a gathering of the nine members of all the national governing bodies around the world um, who come to vote in a secret ballot uh, in a very spiritual atmosphere for the um, international governing body. Um, From the point of view of pilgrimage, these are the, 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 the twin shrines. On the left is the shrine of the Bab on Mount Carmel. And on the right is the shrine of Baha'u'llah, which is in, set in gardens just to the north of the city of Akka. Uh, you can actually see very faintly in the distance the uh, ridge of Mount Carmel um, behind it. Um, but the, in, in addition to these two shrines, the, um, and, and the, the one on the right, the shrine of Baha'u'llah is the place towards which Baha'is turn in prayer from, from all over the world. Um, there are a number of other holy places connected to the life of Baha'u'llah and his 24 years there, and those of his successors also. The, the building with the uh, red roof on the right of this picture, this picture is in in Akka, that's part of the of the fortifications in the foreground there, and the building uh, with the red roof is one that was occupied by Baha'u'llah and where he actually penned um, the book which he entitled the most holy book. It's the book of his laws and ordinances 
um, and is one of a central part of the of the of the literature. Um, and uh, until the pandemic, and this this is this is a picture actually of this is Haifa. This is Abdul Baha returning to his home on the, a, a street that was called the Street of the Persians because of him and and the others who were who were there. Um, so this is another part of the one of the uh, other holy places. Um, the there's a constant stream of Baha'i pilgrims, at least there was until the pandemic shut down international travel. Uh, I've got a few pictures here that you may see and uh, give you a little bit of the spirit of these gatherings is, and some of the places that they visit. Uh, but the, the sites are also um, not only open to pilgrims, in fact, they serve really two publics. They're also very much open to the central, to the, to the, uh, the wider public. Uh, and here's some images of the public visiting the sites. Most of these are in, are in Haifa. And as you can see, uh, this, uh, there are tourists from abroad, but also from every, all different parts of the public uh, in Israel, from the um, uh, Israel Defense Forces on the right there to uh, people from Arab, Arab villages of the Galilee and everywhere. And one of the things we've noticed is a lot of people come for their wedding pictures. <laughs> in this particular shot, there are three different weddings, ha three different couples having their, their pictures taken in the, the plaza at the foot of the terraced gardens. Um, so we, we're we've um, moved on into the relationship from the relationship with the authorities to the relationship with the general public and um, this is a very important part of it now the the uh, unesco and put on the world heritage list in 2008 um, uh, when i was serving there they the israeli media did a um, an internet sort of contest to say what were the seven wonders of of Israel, and um, the uh, the gardens in Haifa were very highly ranked in that choice by the by the public in in Israel. Um, the to to make the visits easier, there's a a, a website which talks about. Um, the schedules and the, the expectations and recommendations for visit and maps and how to get there and all that sort of thing to, to not so much to make publicity, but to be user friendly and to adjust expectations to tell people what time to come and when not to come and what to expect and uh, you know the dress, please wear clothing that covers it and uh, because of the pebbled paths and slippery pavements, comfortable shoes, all, all this, this this sort of thing. Um, the the visitor the these statistics are rather outdated, uh, but this was a graph that comparing the the visitor numbers in the Baha'i Gardens with Caesarea and Masada, which are some of the most popular sites in in the country. They're both national parks, and it was actually looking also in relation to the kind of geopolitical events that were going on. Uh, if you see here, the, the blue line is the Baha'i Gardens. It hit a big dip in 2006, which was when uh, we were getting rockets from Lebanon on a regular occasion, and that certainly had its impact on the visitors. Uh, but then in 2009, when the trouble was in the south of the country, in, in Gaza and elsewhere, the other Two sites took a hit while the uh, while the the Baha'i Gardens kept uh, kept rising. Now, I sorry I don't have the figures updated to 2020, but I was speaking with some friends in Haifa recently, and apparently the numbers now are well over the million a year million visitors a year mark. I think it was 1.2 million uh, in 2019, but that's just, that's just hearsay, so I couldn't put it on the graph. <laughs> um, these visitor flows, of course, have economic, have beneficial economic impact. Uh, I remember when the terraces were opened and the, the lighting at night, that um, 
the what, what and what you're seeing here in these pictures are activities going on in what was once the, the German colony at the foot of Mount Carmel and is now a place full of restaurants and coffee, coffee shops and so on, many of which were opened in the very weeks after the, after the gardens, um, uh, the, after the expansion of the gardens was, was open to the public. And um, it was quite, quite striking that just the, uh, the effect of the aesthetics is not only the, the draw of actual visitors to the garden, but the, the, the beauty of the place, and particularly at night, is part of what um, sort of led to the re revival of activity in, the, in this uh, historic uh, German colony. Um, so I want to um, say that, the, that in, in relation to the, the Middle East situation and the public uh, in Israel, um, Baha'is, there are a number of things that Baha'is do not do. One is to um, spread the Baha'i faith or even accept conversions. Uh, another is that the Baha'is do not preach to Arabs and Jews about peace or what they should do to promote it. Uh, we do not take part in political debates or co public controversies, and we do not fund social projects that have specific partisan agendas. The way we try to contribute is really by cultivating um, beautiful, aesthetically pleasing and peaceful spaces to which in which all can feel uh, safe and welcome. And these, these are really primarily the gardens. Um, and and you know, these are some pictures of the maintenance and the guarding of the gardens. Uh, we also uh, are involved in, in actively in contacts with the other religions uh, of the Holy Land, um, have hosted uh, meetings of the uh, the Council of Religious Leaders for the country. This is a meeting with the mayor of Haifa at the time and some of those religious leaders. Uh, we also try to model in action the possibility and the power of unity and diversity through our employment practices uh, and also some events that we have in annually in Akka and Jerusalem. Um, and one of my favorite memories of the years in Haifa was days when the gardens were open, wide open to the public uh, on this, the day that these pictures were taken, uh, that we had something like 10,000 visitors in a four hour period in the morning. And as you can see from the pictures, they came from every, every part of Israeli society. Uh, and again, our villages and uh, ultra orthodox and secular and rich and poor and everything else. And um, it, was, it was really very, very moving because um, in the Baha'i writings, it says that you, one of these sort of images that promotes the idea of unity and diversity is that of the, of, of the garden. The diversity of the flowers is what makes it beautiful. And I just remember that, that day and the others when this took place as a, a time when the, the human garden <laughs> the diversity of the human garden was on display within the uh, the natural garden <laughs> uh, or the uh, cultivated garden, if you, if, if you will. Um, and and we, we, on a number of occasions, we actually had Israelis who came to us and said, you know, I, I came to this event and I brought my daughter, my cousin, my, ne my niece, whatever, um, because I wanted them to see what Israel could be like if we all could get along. Um, so I'm coming to the to the conclusion, and I have a few common remarks. This is this is a view of the shrine lit at night, um, and I just want want to to say here that the um, the way the Baha'is understand it, the return of the Jewish people to its homeland is seen as a fulfillment of prophecy, prophecies which are found in Christianity and Islam as well as the elsewhere, as well as in the Jewish faith. And the establishment of the state of Israel is an integral part of this historic process of redemption. We believe that as 
most religions do, that suffering, that hum, human, what humanity suffers has a function. When one of the Baha'i writings, the mind and spirit of man advance most when he is tried by suffering. Uh, the unspeakable horrors of the Holocaust yielded the state of Israel and an international system of protection of human rights, which has been very helpful to, to Baha'is. Uh, and to every everyone, and the you know we think that the story of Job or Yohav in the Bible uh, is an indication of this um, suffering and and its role, and that there's no doubt some connection between the um, the the suffering of the Jewish people and the and the extraordinary achievements, the number of um, Nobel prizes and as measured by the number of Nobel Prizes and other things. Um, and perhaps it's worth remembering in these days, when again, we're, we're suffering, the world is suffering through this pandemic, um, that the Baha'is believe that the creator of the universe continues to be involved in history and that mankind will find its way to lasting peace through the suffering, through what we're learning from the suffering, um, Collectively and indiv individually, it seems we have a lot to learn, um, and somehow we seem to learn best from painful experience. And this is why some of these difficult things are happen to us because we we need we need that learning. So finally, to come back to the questions at the beginning, um, the relationship with Judaism, we Baha'is honor and respect all religions. Uh, we're particularly close to the other religions of the Islamic, of the, uh, sorry, of the uh, Abrahamic uh, family. Uh, if you look at it, the actual closest relation is probably with Islam because they're closest in time. And you could compare that, uh, the relationship with Islam, to the relationship between Christianity uh, and Judaism. Christianity grew out of Jewish roots and Baha'i faith grew out of Islamic roots in the same sense. There's a place where uh, Shoghi Effendi, the great grandson of Baha'u'llah, describes Islam as the progenitor and the persecutor, in some sense an abusive parent, um, but nonetheless the, the parent. Um, on the question of complicity and spies and all that, well, no, the, uh, the Baha'is are obedient to the government, but not involved in politics. And it's the same stance of Baha'is everywhere uh, in, in Israel and everywhere else. As for the bigger question expressed in the title of the presentation, well, I've told you what I know about the subject, but to be honest, it doesn't really add up to an answer. There remains a mysterious element of destiny or divine planning uh, that may become clearer in a century or two. Uh, and in the meantime, I invite you to reflect on it. And uh, on that note, let's open up for questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it was a very beautiful and visual presentation. Uh, so many pictures that I think many of us had never seen before. So I, I really thank you for your efforts in putting those together. Thank you. Um, I do have some questions that I'd like to begin with, uh, Dr. Lincoln. Um, the first question, I think many people are wondering about the relationship of Israel and the Baha'i World Center. And uh, a couple of the questions that I will be asking start like this, does Jerusalem play any role in the Baha'i dispensation historically? Not, not a significant one. <clears throat> um, and it, <clears throat> in some sense, I think that in some ways, um, it's, uh, I should say, I could say fortunate or a part of this uh, mystery I <clears throat> alluded to that, um, that the Baha'i Center ended up in Haifa, which has a long, quite a long history of pluralism and um, and and um, uh, tolerance 
of, of different minorities. And it's, it's a place where uh, the Baha'is have really felt at home for a long time. I think that we may have contributed to building that tradition, but we didn't, uh, we, we didn't invent it. <laughs> um, but it certainly has provided a hospitable, uh, a hospitable home for the Baha'i World Center. Now, this is not neg anything negative about, about Jerusalem. Um, uh, Baha'is visit Jerusalem and, and enjoy visiting the holy places associated with, with um, the other religions. But um, I think from the functional point of view, it's nice to be at a, at a safe distance. Wonderful. Uh, about Haifa, the following question, um, what is the impact of uh, the Baha'i gardens to the city of Haifa? What does the government uh, think about Haifa in terms of how the Baha'is have contributed? Well, I, <clears throat> I think that the, the elements that I mentioned in my presentation, uh, that they're very aware of that. Uh, <clears throat> for the city to have a, a site that attracts a million visitors a year uh, right in the middle of the city is, is a very significant um, asset. It comes, of course, with, it, with its own problems. <laughs> um, when we're about to uh, um, open the, the extended gardens, I remember having the conversation with the mayor about the danger of everybody wanting to come and visit on the first day. And they had recently had an opening of the IKEA store in, I think it was Netanya, which had resulted in gridlock on the highways for hours. <laughs> And, and so we actually, after consulting with the mayor, one on the ra on the radio, I, I, actually the mayor had a regular program and invited me as his guest. And I said, "Don't come the first day; it'll still be there on the second, and the third, and the fourth, and a month later." So you know, t take it easy. <laughs> There's no hurry. <laughs> um, so it it has its headaches in terms of parking and numbers of people and uh, the how to manage the flow, uh, but. Even today, uh, the Baha'i World Center is in close consultation and collaboration with the city to see how best, how best to do that and what kind of changes uh, need to take place in the infrastructure in the surrounding areas and what kinds of changes would be compatible with the nature of the site and also what the Baha'is need to do in the way they arrange uh, to receive visitors. So it's, it's, um, and, and I would say it's also at the national level, the, the, the authorities are aware of this. Uh, it's one of the factors I think that was uh, behind the, the, the signing of the agreement. It's not all about religions, it's also about um, tourism and the national interest uh, in perfectly straightforward ways. Right, thank you. Uh, the third question, is uh, to what extent does the Israeli government interfere with the running of uh, the Baha'i World Center, um, whether it be financially or socially or in terms of tourism? Yeah, um, really very little. I mean, anybody who coexists under a government has to deal with regulations and, and policies and so on, but there's no, there's no direct uh, interference. And the fact that the Baha'is do not um, receive or accept any sorts of subsidies or financial support from the government makes, makes a big difference. Um, one of the aspects of things in, in Israel is that the, the government has assumed responsibility for the provision of religious services to the population. And under that guise, they actually do finance the functions of, uh, initially it was the, the different uh, Jewish institutions, but then uh, by, as a basis of equality, that was extended to Christian and, and uh, Islamic uh, institutions that serve the, the Arab public. Um, and that um, financial involvement does lead to um, well, <laughs> raises some issues, put it that way. Uh, but we, we don't have those because we, um, we do not um, receive that kind of, of, of subvention. 
I see. Um, can I ask you a follow-up then? Um, this, I might get in trouble for asking you a historic question. Uh, which, who was the actual Israeli leader who signed the agreement in uh, 1987 with, with the Baha'is? <laughs> it, it was Shimon Peres. At the time, uh, he was deputy prime minister in a national unity government with um, uh, Begin, I, I believe it was at the time. Um, and uh, he was also Minister of Foreign Affairs. Lovely. And what no, no, had, no had, he, <laughs> sorry, had he ever visited the uh, Baha'i Gardens or uh, did he come in to the seat of the Universal House of Justice? Could you give us some background about that? He did both of those uh, before signing and after signing, and in um, and the, the, then there was the continued to be some uh, a relationship uh, and you know, during right up to his period as as president of the state of Israel, um, and I I can remember a number of uh, meetings with him, um, and a a, a deeply uh, impressive uh, gentleman, uh, and what he always remembered about the Baha'i is how we, we grow flowers. <laughs> um, lovely. So, um, what would you say is the relationship of the Baha'i World Center with Israel today, in the sense that, for example, does the Israeli government ever ask? the World Center for uh, the opinion of the Baha'is in case of some political upheaval or some, or did, did for example, or would the Israeli government ask the Baha'is point of view on, on the pandemic, for example, how to deal with problems? Uh, to my knowledge, that has not happened. Um, and I, I think that, um, well, the, the relationship would be said to be um, dependably good and over long periods of time and with governments, both of the right and the left and so on. Uh, we are not um, in the center of their preoccupations. There are many other more important issues that they, or, or more pressing issues that they have to deal with. Uh, and they, um, they respond, I mean, to us when we come to them with, with difficulties, they try to be cooperative. Um, they consider Baha'is as, as, as friends because I think we have a, a history of dealing with them in a trustworthy and an open manner. And they know that we don't get involved in their politics and so on. Um, I think most recently where we are the uh, my successor in the position of Secretary General is a public health expert, uh, Dr. De David uh, Rutstein, that uh, some offer was made of his expertise, but I'm not sure that the government uh, took it up. And he's, he's been very helpful in, in advising the House of Justice about how to deal with this, but I don't, and, and perhaps also perhaps consulted with the, the municipal authorities in Haifa, but not at the national level, to my knowledge. I see. Thank you. Um, could you give us some background as to how these gardens are supported, how the buildings are maintained financially, as well as in terms of the youth and the other members of the Baha'i world that uh, go to Israel to work there? Right. Well, the, basically the maintenance and the operating of the, the holy places and all the grounds is uh, uh, paid for by donations from the Baha'i communities of the entire world. And the, the staff, the, well, there are two elements in the staff. Uh, there are the seven to 800 volunteers uh, from around the world. And they are, they are Baha'is, they're members of Baha'i communities and they serve without uh, without pay um, at, at the Baha'i World Center. And then there are, uh, last I knew, a couple of hundred 
uh, local employees uh, who work in different in different functions in the gardens and secretarial and translations and uh, administrative functions of different kinds. Uh, and they, of course, employ uh, are paid normal salaries under uh, Israeli uh, law and with the, the relevant taxes and that sort of thing. Um, the <coughs> the the, um, the one sort of benefit that is is helpful is that um, buys do receive sort of the equivalent of tax exemptions or tax neutralization from the government, which is extremely um, um, supportive of what we do, but uh, we don't consider that, and it's explicitly stated that that's not a subvention, that it is something that uh, we ask for because it is the way religions are treated <clears throat> in, in many countries all over the world, that, um, that they you know, get some relief from taxation. I see, thank you. I have a couple of questions um, regarding the Baha'is uh, in Iran and uh, some of the troubles that Baha'is around the world have with relation to Israel being our holy land as well. Uh, what would you say, and if you could give us some of your um, thoughts on what are the ramifications of the accusation that Baha'is give funds um, to Israel when Iran especially does not uh, recognize Israel as a legal uh, nation and how this has contributed to the persecutions of the Baha'is in Iran. Honestly, I, I believe it is not, has not contributed at all. This is, this is a way of explaining something which is otherwise very difficult to justify. Uh, <clears throat> the, the, the Muslims of the world over send money to maintain the Al-Aqsa Mosque uh, Christians of the world over send money to maintain the Christian holy places and Jews as well. Uh, I don't see in any way why the fact that Baha'is send money to maintain their holy places uh, is an issue. Now, I did refer to the fact that, that they're saying, oh, it's because your world center is, is, in, is in Haifa, you must be uh, agents of Zionism and so on. But that's forgetting that it was a Muslim ruler who sent Baha'u'llah there. And at the time when he did so, it was under Islamic rule. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what, what, what do they want, you know, the, the Baha'is to do, uh, sort of move out? <laughs> um, tell us, Dr. Lincoln, now we, I think people want to know about your experience in, in Israel. Could you tell us some stories about what were, the most interesting aspects of your work with Israelis. Um, did you speak, do you speak Hebrew? Uh, what was your relationship with um, some of the people that you met? Who did you like the most? Give us some of the stories. <laughs> well, uh, <coughs> I, I, won't, I won't play favorites, but I met a very great, that Shahakti Milim, well, I met a very great. Yoter shotefet mi mi dictacti. So I, I I just just to to prove my point, I just said that, that I do I do speak Hebrew. It's getting a little rusty, <laughs> and uh, sometimes I'm forgetting words, but uh, it's it, it's still there. Uh, I I enjoyed my stay there really very much and appreciated tremendously how um, how real the relationships were. Uh, very rarely was a relationship superficial. Uh, you got into the, the meat of things very, very quickly. And sometimes um, I think that the, it's in the culture to provoke another person in order to find out what they're made of. <laughs> uh, so that I, I can remember it, you know, when we moved into an apartment in, in Haifa, uh, one of our neighbors, parked his car systematically in front of our garage <laughs> and, until I went and knocked on his door to say hello. <laughs> and after that, everything was fine between us. Uh, but that was the, typical of, of many aspects of the relationship where um, one needed to be forthright. And um, 
there were often, quite often, difficulties. I had a, um, or we had a an Israeli advisor whom I relied on extensively because of his cultural knowledge, and um, whenever we had real difficulties with people, and sometimes there were people who made who were making trouble for us for one reason or another, um, and his pres his prescription was generally go meet them, go sit down and talk to them. <laughs> and on a number of occasions I've had the experience of doing that and finding that a great deal could be resolved by that direct manner and listening to what the person had to say and, and, and responding to it in a, in a, human, in a human way. And um, that was just very, very rich and in many ways very sweet. And, and over the 20 years we were there, um, you know, I had some very difficult discussion with some people. I can remember occasions when I pounded the table <laughs> and, um, you know, talked talk pretty tough. But I think that all of those people uh, then became really our, our, our friends. Um, and, and I don't remember really any, having left anyone as, a, as, a, as an enemy or someone that I wouldn't be happy to see again, uh, again today. Um, there were, um, in, in order to be in contact with the local community, I joined the Haifa Rotary Club. <laughs> um, and for um, uh, one, one year, I was actually elected the president of the club. Uh, it was a club that had Arab and Jewish members um, and that was a very important part of it. Um, I guess I, I mentioned rapidly uh, these uh, annual events that we held in um, around the time of the Baha'i New Year. Uh, and one of them was a, a reception in a hotel in Jerusalem, which was our way of saying thank you to the people that we worked with uh, day in, day out. But it was became a very popular event. Uh, we had members of the diplomatic corps, representatives of the other religions, uh, the university people, government people, um, pe people from uh, the the, um, the Arab part of Jerusalem, uh, and and this this was some of the events that people would come to and then tell us we we came to see how our country could be if we could just learn to get along together, because they could actually feel the, the, uh, the friendship and the warmth and the, um, and the, and the spirit of the, of the gathering. Um, How lovely. How lovely. Um, I have one more question for you, back to a historic question here. What do you, we know about the nature of diplomatic relations between the faith and the Ottoman British Israeli authorities in the time of Baha'u'llah, Abdul Baha, and Shoghi Effendi. How has this evolved? <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm going to have to uh, <laughs> condense that answer quite a lot. But basically, on, it, it, got, it got better and better. Um, <laughs> the relation with the Ottomans was not good. Uh, they were hostile anyway but also because the Ottoman Empire itself was falling apart and the, um, and, <clears throat> and the, the, the Holy Land was a province relatively far, relatively remote, considered as a remote province, not really under full control of the sublime port in, in, uh, in Istanbul. Uh, so it was difficult both because of the, the general hostility and because of the factionalism and disputes and things that were going on among the, uh, the Turks and between the Turks and the other populations that they were, they were ruling at that time. Uh, the British mandate um, brought a different view, sort of the Anglo-Saxon approach to uh, law, but, but it was also under terrific stress uh, due to the emerging uh, Arab-Jewish conflict in, in the Holy Land, which eventually resulted in the end of the, of the mandate and the departure of the British under very 
uh, very difficult circumstances. Um, it's interesting that that some of the um, uh, let's see accommodations that the faith needed to uh, build and maintain the holy places. I mean, the the construction of the shrine of the Bab was was uh, started during this period. The accommodations were obtained on a sort of de facto basis during the British time, uh, but almost nothing in the way of formal recognition uh, dates really from that from that time. Um, the, so that a great deal of that process took place from 1948 onward, and it's a very slow process, but because the gov the the state itself was slow in, in developing. It was born through, through struggle and through immigration and, and a very tumultuous history with, with many, a number of um, conflicts, internal and external and, and so on. The history is well known. But over, over the 70 years that uh, we're talking about, um, the, you know, gradually things have been more formalized. The, the nature of this, the agreement that was signed in, the 19, in 1987 um, <clears throat> was a very significant step in terms of formalizing an evolution that had been taking place really from the time of the British uh, onward, but very gradually. So I, I hope that gives some, <laughs> some satisfaction to the person who asked the question, but, uh, and I hope they also recognize that um, a, a full answer would, be <laughs> would keep us here all night. Absolutely. I think, I, I think everybody's aware that this can't be a whole history presentation in the last uh, 10 minutes that we do have. But <laughs> as the interest continues um, in your personal experiences in Israel and the other countries that you lived in, if you were to describe um, your Israeli experience as the real uh, experience, you felt like the, your your relationships were real. Your friendships uh, were real. Um, what would be, um, in just a few words, your experience in France or in the countries in Africa that you lived in, um, with regards to the culture of the people you were in touch with there? And just by the way, uh, you you have. Um, somebody from the audience says they're impressed with your Hebrew, so you're on the right track there. Okay. <laughs> All right. I, I, I won't say anything more. If I got that far, <laughs> I better rest on my laurels. <laughs> um, you know, that question, I think, as I, um, you know, I, I don't think it's, it's, it makes sense to go into comparisons. Our, our time in, in Africa was also very, very rich and very wonderful and, and quite unforgettable. And uh, we're still in close touch with friends from the countries where we live uh, in the former French colonies in Africa, Central African Republic and Cameroon and, and Ivory Coast, and feel very attached to those places. That's where we, we raised our children, where they went to school. Um, and, um, and we're also tremendously, um, how shall I say, uplifted by the progress that those communities are making now, uh, despite the fact that a number of them, the, 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 they have economic difficulties, they have political difficulties, they have public health difficulties. Uh, some of them, like the Central African Republic and Cameroon and neighbors like uh, the, the Democratic Republic of Congo are actually some of the most dynamic Baha'i communities in the, in the entire world today. And we remember the time when they, was, they were just, just setting out and, and wobbly on their legs. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I think if I kept on with these questions, we could get more stories from you, but we are nearing the end of our time with you tonight. I'd like to thank you again for giving us your time and spending this precious moment sharing your stories as well as the history of the Baha'i faith in Israel. I would just like to remind everybody that this uh, fireside um, has been recorded and will be on the site, uh, which is called 
www.firesidebahai.org. Uh, and eventually it will be on there in a couple of weeks. If any of you, know you uh, I was trying to figure who they are. If any of you have a, black guy? a desire to unmute yourselves and like say hello, to the so I feel like some people have already unmuted themselves. So please feel free to say hello to now, and uh, thank you so much, Dr. Thank you, and thank you, friends, for all your great questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Toda. Toda roba. Let's go. Bye bye.